Hi, I'm Mike, owner of the Ingroom in Phoenix, Arizona. Today I'm going to do a review and comparison of Nirvana's Nevermind, one of the greatest albums of all time. For me, it was one of those defining childhood albums when I was young. This was kind of the, you know, the definition of the 90s was Nirvana. Now, I went to school in the late 90s. By then, Kurt had already passed in my high school years, but this album lived, lived throughout the 90s into today probably one of the top 10 albums of all time it's an unbelievable album if you don't own it you should what are you waiting for so this particular review is a little bit interesting in the fact that you know i went into it with kind of some preconceived notions on what should sound good what's going to sound good what i've listened to in the past what i thought in the past was great and a lot of that kind of got dispelled, and my opinion on these pressings kind of changed pretty rapidly. So I'm going to start off with this. This is the very first copy of this album on vinyl that I ever owned. This is the original club copy. The club copy is signified, let's see if I can get it into the camera view there. There is a CRC on the label. I remember when I got this album years and years ago. It was 50 bucks. I got it at a record store along with a copy of Metallica's Kill 'Em All. I think they were both, you know, 50 bucks on the wall. And I traded some pitcher sleeves, some Beatles pitcher sleeves that I had uh, from when I was a teenager going to yard sales and flea markets. I accumulated tons of Beatle pitcher sleeves, but I remember getting that for 50 bucks. For a lot of years, I thought, wow, this is a pretty good sounding album. Then I got other copies, and I really just never listened to this anymore. Now, I mean, putting it into perspective, this thing is listless. This thing's on popular. A Vita Vita Vegemin isn't even going to make this thing pop. It's awful. This is an awful, awful, awful sounding record. It is cut really soft, which just allows all the pops, clicks, surface noise, the vinyl to shine through. There's no soundstage whatsoever. I could have been listening to this thing in the other room, it would have sounded just as good. This record is absolutely atrocious and awful. And I'm gonna start off doing this shootout with the worst sounding copies. And this fits the bill. So, atrocious. There's some other copies too that I don't have to show you, but I'm gonna talk about. I've had them in the past. And I'll kind of mention them. Very, very similar to the club copy is the original 1996 Japanese pressing. This is very similar in the fact that it is lifeless. There is no soundstage. There are no upper end frequencies on this record whatsoever. Just horrible, horrible sounding record. It's not cut super low like the club copy, so it's not nearly as bad. Uh, the thing about this record is, right from the jump, Smells Like Team Spirit, Dave's drum set, when he starts firing into that kick drum, the better sounding versions of this record just punch you. And this doesn't do it. That club copy doesn't do it. I've got two Wilson Thor's hammers here, and when these things are like silent, there's no low frequency in the grooves on these records. They're just not there. I've got all the means in the world to produce low frequency. Those albums don't have it on it. It's gone. It's just bad. All right, so the next copy I got here is the 2007 Japanese pressing. So this at least flushes out the bottom end. It doesn't really have a great sound stage. It doesn't really have uh, you know, that nice middle range, which you want on a grunge record. The sweet, the magic is in the middle on this particular album, and this is kind of missing, but it has a much better lower end. No soundstage, sorely missing mids, sorely missing upper end, but at least it has a lower end. It has some drive to it, which is missing big time on these other pressings. And mind you, I mean, with the Wilsons, these speakers just shine in the upper end. 
Nobody will ever say, you know what, those Wilson Alexandries, they really just don't really do much on the upper end. So when it when I listen to that album on these speakers and there's nothing there, it's like you know there's a problem with the mastering. Big time. So this for years was considered. I remember going online and hearing about how this is the end all be all. This is the German 320 mastering. And the way you could tell that in the dead wax, the very end of the matrix code, the matrix being the information on the dead wax, which is the label in between the label and in between the actual information where the record is, the grooves are. You know, so between the grooves and between the label, that's the dead wax. The matrix, the numbers in the dead wax, ending in 320, that's the 320 press. This particular mastering has been out for some time. Even, I, you know, I went online and I was looking around. Discog shows that there's a black on black pressing that's in print today that still uses the 320 matrix. Online for years and years and years, everyone said how this is the one you should own, how this is fantastic. I will say, very similar to the Japanese pressing, now we've got a lot, I mean, this solved the problem like that most of these albums had that I've already showed you. There's a lot of force, there's a lot of bite in the low end frequencies. It has a much more cohesive sound stage. It actually now sounds like Nirvana's in front of you playing. But I still don't feel like the mids are there. I feel like the mids are a little bit scooped and it's still missing in the upper end. Uh, it just doesn't sound as organic either. I'd be venturing to say this was made from a digital file by the sound of it, but it has a very inorganic sound to it. You got to keep in mind, Nirvana was a three-piece band. This album was recorded really, really raw. So the best sounding versions of this album, there's a lot of magic in the instrumentation. You could really, really, really identify, like, that's, that's a guitar there. The strings buzz. You know, you can hear the crash cymbals, the ride cymbals on the kit. You could feel the thump of the bass on the kick drum. You know, you can feel that bass guitar making runs. You know, you don't have that on a lot of these pressings that I've had so far. You can't really get in there and say, like, yeah, man, that sounds just like, you know, Kurt was playing in my living room. That's that's what I'd be hearing. You know, that, that guitar would have that shimmer to it. Not here on this particular record. But it's very, very listenable. But there's no reason to seek this record out. If you're watching this video and you own any of these other records, The beautiful thing about it is you can fix the error in your ways for much less money. But we'll get to that. The second most expensive record I'm going to show you here, this is the Nirvana Nevermind Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs from 1996. One of my absolute favorite labels of all time. Almost everything that they're making in 2021 at the timing of this video is on point. They miss the point with this particular album. And for as much money as it goes for, you would really expect this thing to sizzle. But there's so many Mobile Fidelity collectors. There's a reason why albums of Mobile Fidelity albums of thunderstorms and trains go for 50 to 100 bucks. People collect the label. I collect the label. I've got a whole bunch of Mobile Fidelity records that I will never listen to. Melissa Manchester, Barry Manilow's greatest hits. There's some duds in the 80s that were made. But people collect the label. The problem with this particular pressing is there's great instrument separation. There's a sound stage. But this is a very in-the-middle type of album, sound-wise. You don't have that dynamic range. You have a nice, great instrument separation, but it's all in the middle. You don't have that thunderous kick drum. You don't have those uh, guitar licks that kind of reach out of the speaker and crunch they're just not there you know it it's got a real solid uh it's got a real solid upper end which is severely lacking from this album kurt wanted this album originally to sound like a black sabbath album and we, when they were initially trying to master it he was constantly going in there and turning down the treble didn't end up coming out that way but This album kind of corrects a lot of that upper end frequency that's missing on some of the other pressings we talked about. 
good sounding record, but not worth nearly the money that this thing is going for today. I mean, six, seven, eight hundred bucks. A lot of money, a lot of money. Okay. This is the ORG pressing that came out, I believe, originally in 2009, but it was in print for some years. This was cut from the original analog master tape by the one and only Bernie Grumman, one of the best mastering engineers in the entire world, still cutting records to this day. When I uh, release my Wild Times LP, which is not out at the time of this uh, video, I had a cut. The only one and only LP that I ever had cut was done by Bernie Grumman. He's a legend. This album sounds absolutely fantastic. It's just... It's unbelievably sounding. Uh, this now sounds like a proper band. Everybody playing, the drums sound like drums, the guitar sounds like the guitar. I mean, it's just, it's on point in every which way. Everything is so crisp. This has kind of a similar quality to, if you have a Led Zeppelin II, a Robert Ludwig Led Zeppelin II, I did a shootout video of that. How it has almost a sound that comes out from your speakers and kind of just punches you in the face. That that guitar, that crunch, that's that's here on this album. When he gets into the kick, you know, when that kick drum starts on Smells Like Teen Spirit, and it just starts, you know, that almost sounds like a double kick. I'm not a drummer, but almost kind of has like a double kick drum sound to it. it it's thunderous. This album is absolutely fantastic. The ORG does not go for a lot of money. Original ORGs come in a few different configurations. So this is the black vinyl. The original ORG pressings that Bernie Grunman did the mastering for came pressed at RTI, and they had a black vinyl version, and they had a blue vinyl version. The blue vinyl, in my opinion, has been just a little bit noisier. Not much. Not that if you have the blue, not something you need to seek out an ORG black vinyl, but... It goes for more money, and it doesn't sound better. And if it doesn't sound better, it isn't worth more money if it's not a collectible. And, you know, collectibles, to me, are defined by two things. Is it an original? It can only be original once. If it's an original pressing, it'll always be collectible because it was the first. You can never be first twice. You only can be the first one time. Other things that are collectible are in my opinion, things that sound great. You know, when it comes to great sounding records, there's a reason to own great sounding records. Those will always be in demand because if you have one of the best sounding records ever pressed, there's audio files that are always gonna want it. And then you've got like a third tier collectible that I don't really care about. But if you're a hardcore Nirvana fan, which there's tons of them, probably the, one of the top five collected bands of all time, you gotta have everything. You've got completist. But, the blue, I, I don't find necessary to have the blue here. Later on, the ORG pressing was done at Palace in Germany. Still a fantastic sounding record, no problem. So ORG lost the license to the record. And you would think to yourself, oh my God, this is a crime. They had, this was like 20 bucks when it was new, or 20, maybe 20 bucks. Not very expensive. All analog, audiophile pressing through and through. At the time, I don't think people realized how good they had it. But this thing is unbelievable. ORG lost the license to it, and it's like, oh, my God, right? You think, oh, my God. Well, that happens, and then guess what? Somehow the original metalwork that Bernie Grunman cut from the original master tape ends back in the hand of Universal, and then Universal starts making their own version. I think this one's $25. Currently in print, press that palace where ORG was pressing theirs, from the original Bernie Grunman metalwork. So for $25 in 2021, you could still get a phenomenal sounding, all analog, killer, killer cut. And in my opinion, this is the second best sounding this record has ever sounded. Whether it's the ORG blue, black, RTI pressing, palace pressing, or the current in-print palace pressing, they all use the original Bernie Grunman mastering. There's also some black and black pressings that use the Bernie Grunman mastering. It's really easy to tell if the Bernie Grunman mastering was used because BG is in the dead wax. The original metal work that was used by ORG, they scratched out the ORG, but you could still see Bernie Grunman in the dead wax. This is, if you're looking for this album, get it while they're still using the Bernie Grunman mastering. It is absolutely phenomenal. I mean, it is 
there is no reason to have a better sounding, you know, there's no reason to seek out something else unless you really, really got to have the peak of what this album is capable of and you're willing to spend 85 times <laughs> some stupid amount. I mean, what is it? I'm trying to do the rough math in my head. It's a lot. It's a lot, lot, lot more for a very few percentage points more for a better sounding. And that is my newly acquired original pressing. Holy cow. So they got this record right the first time around. And that is so unique. It has never, in my opinion, been bested. And it's kind of funny. I know so many guys that are just so into audio file pressing. So many of my customers, so many people I see online, they only buy audio file pressings because they don't want to filter through all the dead weight that's out there. And there's a lot of it. But let me tell you, this is a very rewarding experience when you stumble upon an original copy of this and it sounds killer. Now, I know a lot of people will say, well, you know, you just got that record. It's new to you. And, uh, you know, you spent a lot of money. You got to justify your purchase by making it the best sounding pressing. If you guys have watched my videos, for any amount of time, you know that's not the case. I regularly trash high-end pressings all the time, value I, because they sound like turds. But this is not the case. I bought this album originally about a year ago, in the middle of the pandemic. Unfortunately, I bought it twice. Both times came from Europe, came DHL, and they were melted. Not warped, but straight melted. Destroyed. It was horrible. It was... You know, but I, and I was paying like $500 for near main copies of it. And that's what they went for in the middle of 2020. Then, I, you know, 2020 goes into 2021. I'm looking for a copy of this thing, man. These things are nowhere to be found. I'm seeing them, but $1,500 to $2,000. And there was nothing even close to what I had paid for the first two copies that came destroyed. And I had thought to myself, you know, I'm just going to wait. For that more affordable copy to come. Well, guess what? That more affordable copy never came. Then people started paying more and more. Then you would see completed sales at the much higher asking price. Then I kind of just realized that this was the new norm. It took a little time for this to sink in how crazy vinyl has gotten in the last year, but now it has gotten extremely expensive. And unfortunately, this is like triple the price of what it was going for a year ago. But this is an unbelievably good sounding record. Almost every record made in the 90s sounds like utter trash. They could care less about vinyl. It was, there were some indie bands, but most of those were doing kind of, you know, the, the recording on a lot of stuff wasn't that great from a lot of the more indie bands. But your big time commercial bands could absolutely give two shits about vinyl in the 90s because nobody bought vinyl in the 90s. I didn't even know new vinyl existed in the 90s. When I went into my local music store, Camelot Music, in the mall back in Florida, there was no vinyl. Maybe you would see an Abbey Road or something, but the vinyl section might have been, it just it was non-existent. There were CDs, so the manufacturers didn't put a lot of effort into vinyl, but they put an immense amount of effort into vinyl when it came out to, you know, when it came to this record. It's unbelievably sounding. It's funny because I started to shoot out with this record because it was my newest record. I wanted to hear it. And I remember putting it on and it was just like, yeah, this is going to be fun. You know, I've done some of these shootouts where it's like, oh my God, do I really have to listen to one more time? Do I have to listen to Peg? It's, please, no, 50 times later, listening to Peg. It's not good for your mental psyche. But I put this album on and I'm like, yeah. I can listen to Smells Like Teen Spirit 50 times. This is going to be a good time. But it was kind of sad because every time I put another album on, you know, listen to this, do a swap, put on the club copy. It's like, oh, my God, what happened? Okay, put this copy on. Put that copy on. And it was like, you know, I started ranking them. I started taking notes. I started seeing, okay, what's better? What's? And it was like, it was so disappointing because this was the copy. The very first one I played was the best one I played. This is, this is the Bernie Grunman cut, but the Bernie Grunman cut, I will say, is a little bit more polite. This is not. This kicks you in the groin. I mean, this is exactly like you'd want this album. It has 
super realistic instrumentation, unbelievable soundstage. The highs are as much there as I've heard in any other format, CD, digital, any other version of this record. I mean, it has that grit in the middle. Like I said, it's just fantastic. It has everything that the Bernie Grunman cut has, but it is more of a Nirvana album. And yeah, I know that sounds, what do you mean it's more of a, it's, it's more of a grunge record. It is less polite. It is more in your face and it has more of that. You want to bang your head sound to it. I mean, it's just, that's the best way to ex ex describe it. I know the audiophile reviewers, they love to use all these words that I just have still to this day, I've never been able to wrap my head around, but this album makes you want to bang your head more. <laughs> and that's what you want when you're listening to Nevermind, you just want to be like into it. And this puts you into it. It's the Bernie Grunman record juiced up a little bit. Now, if I was just starting a record collection and I had say two, 300 records, and I thought to my, you know, would it be worth paying $1,500 for this record? as opposed to $25 for the Palace Press, cut by Bernie Grunman? Unbel no, you, why would you ever do that? I mean, you're getting what, 10% more record for 50 times the price or whatever the math comes out to? You, why would you do that? But in this case, for me, I've got rooms and rooms and rooms of records. I don't have anything musically that I don't want that I really don't have. For the most part, I have everything. Now it's a matter of fine-tuning and getting the best. And when you get to that point or you feel Nirvana is your ultimate band, I mean, this is the only one to own. And it's great for a couple of reasons. The first reason being is it's an original. So not only do you get the best sounding record, you get to own a piece of history. You get to own the very first U.S. American pressing of one of the greatest albums of all time. And yeah, I mean, that's where it's at. You know, uh, I know I specialize in audiophile records and I talk about audiophile records, but guys, don't discount the original stuff. There are some records that sound absolutely amazing, if done right the very first time. Because you got to think, especially a record like this that was recorded analog. When this record was cut, it was the absolute freshest the tape had ever been. It had the least amount of tapes, plays that the tape has ever had. So that you're already starting ahead of the game. If you can do it right the first time, you've already got the cleanest, crispest copy of the original master tape. And in this case, it was done right the very first time. One of the ways you can tell an original, and you know, you, before you spend this kind of money, you really ought to know what the heck you're doing anyways. But the originals don't have the CRC logo on the, you know, on the label. Let me show you this. So you don't have the CRC logo on the label right here where it says Sub Pop. Also, you know, you're checking on the bottom the date, the barcode, and also the originals had a printed inner sleeve, the original US copy. I ain't gonna pull that out, but go online, look it up. Uh, this is a record that's gonna continue to go up. All records are going up. But let me tell you what, you'll never go wrong collecting Nirvana, one of the absolute top most collected bands of all time, one of the greatest albums of all time, perfect candidate for a collectible because it came out in the 90s when everybody was abandoning vinyl. But yeah, this is, if you're going to drop a bunch of money on a record, you can't go wrong here. All right, guys, don't forget, check us out on the website, www.theingroove.com. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram. Until next time.